Happy New Year, everybody, and uh, welcome to our maintenance area within the uh, museum. Um, in the course of a normal year, we put our weapons, our equipment, our camp, our, our tents, and all the other things we use on a daily basis through a lot of abuse. Uh, and as a result, we do need to do fairly regular maintenance on them. Um, but of course, we spend a lot of our time outside talking to the public, talking to you, uh, doing all sorts of other things throughout the year um, that we get the, the fortunate opportunity to do. But that does mean that when we don't have a lot going on, it is very important for us to go ahead and do the maintenance that, requ that is required to keep everything that you see in the outdoor areas functioning. Um, one of those pieces of equipment that we use a lot uh, and that requires a great deal of work to maintain are the firearms that you might see us use in uh, any of the various demonstrations we do throughout the course of the day. Um, we typically do a course of about 24 demonstrations in the day, or sorry, about 12 demonstrations in a day or so. Uh, that totals to about two shots a demonstration, roughly 24 shots per day. Um, each day we're putting through, uh, you know, usually it's, it's one musket being used for the day, potentially multiples, depending on the conditions of weather conditions and other things. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, we have special events, special programs where we might shoot uh, men, multiple guns in the course of a single demonstration. Um, all that's to say is we put a lot of wear on our weapons. Uh, over the course of a week, we might shoot somewhere close to 168 times or so. Um, and as a result, these weapons would receive a lot of abuse. Um, and so they need a lot of maintenance. Uh, in the course of a normal day, when we're done shooting the weapon, we're gonna make sure that the weapon is clean, that fouling has been removed from the weapon. We're gonna ensure that the barrel on the inside has been thoroughly cleaned and ensure that there's no rust or anything developing in there. Um, that's cleaned out so that the next time we use it, there isn't gonna be a failure of the weapon. Uh, but this does require us to do um, a lot of maintenance on a daily basis. But in addition to that, the internal components of the firearm, all the parts that are more difficult to get to um, over the course of the year will also start to develop problems. If we're constantly putting water down the barrel, water's gonna start to get in between the wood and the metal, um, creating rust and potentially on the inside of the barrel here, you're gonna, or on the underside of the barrel. Um, inside the lock mechanism, you're gonna see fouling and, and dirt and grime building up over time, which could potentially affect the functioning of the lock system. And just means that at some point, we're going to need to make sure this weapon has been thoroughly cleaned. Um, and so this is the time of year where I get the chance to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the disassembly. Um, of course, uh, we're gonna start, in this case, we're gonna start with a British uh, flintlock musket. So the British land service short. And we have the rammer and the bayonet first. And next, we're gonna pull the lock off of the weapon. It, whoop, it very simply comes off using a pair of screws at the back. In which case, I just remove these screws along with the lock plate and the back plate. All right, now we'll remove, we'll pull apart the lock itself in a minute, but I also want to remove the barrel. I want to remove the barrel from the musket. Now, British muskets are held together using a series of pins. We want to be careful about this. We do not want to over, to uh, push too much into the whole pinholes, because I do not want to damage those pinholes and make it difficult for the pins to fit in the future. We've had a few muskets where <clears throat> an overzealous staff member or someone who's just not paying any attention accidentally pushes the pinholes through too much and enlarges the pinholes so the pins don't fit properly. So we want to be very careful how we handle this, but it's not a terribly difficult process. And then we pull the pins out. Now with the pins removed, once we get the pins removed, and we do want to arrange them so we know which pins are going where, once the pins have been removed, we also have to remove the tang screw. And the tang screw is going to be at the base of the, of the, of the barrel. 
and we will remove that in order to fully separate the barrel from the stock. So a tank screw is right here. And we'll make sure we get the right screwdriver so that we're not stripping the screw. That does not seem to be sufficient. There we go. And often, if we don't remove the barrel for a while, the tang screw can get pretty rusty if it wasn't properly treated before it got put in. Even if it get properly treated, it can sometimes still get pretty rusty if it hasn't been removed in a while. So it does make it a little more challenging to get out of all the screws that hold the gun together. There we go. And now the barrel can be removed from the stock. And at this point, technically the trigger housing here can be removed. Um, I just find it unnecessary. I can get to most of those parts and clean them without needing to fully disassemble those. So we're gonna set that aside. Now in this case, this barrel was fairly well treated, so it doesn't look like there was too much rust or damage on the underside, so it won't take too much work to clean that properly. Now, it's time for us to go ahead and disassemble the lock itself. Uh, first things first, let's go ahead and take the outer parts of the lock, the feather spring here first. So I'm gonna put it under some tension and then remove it. And the same will go for the next part, which is the hammer. So the hammer is this piece right here. Most people will think the hammer is this piece. It's familiar to us from modern firearms that the uh, striking action is many times called, is often called the hammer. In a flintlock musket of the 18th century, it's this is the cock, this is the hammer. Now, once we've gotten that done, it's time to go ahead and remove the mainspring. So get the mainspring under some tension as well. Once the mainspring's under tension, we'll go ahead and remove it. Now that that's removed, I want to remove the feather spring, or sorry, the uh, sear spring. And the sear spring is what holds the sear bar under pressure. I'm gonna go ahead and get that out. It's a pretty light spring, so I'm not terribly worried about keeping it under too much tension as I remove it. If you uh, try to take one of the springs off, like the main spring or the feather spring, and there is still tension, it can make it actually very difficult to get the screw out and it can potentially cause the spring to release its pressure and snap. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing something like a mainspring, it's under tension. And then you gently release the tension instead of allowing it to just snap. Otherwise it'll snap apart. From here, we now have to remove the bridle. The bridle covers the tumbler and it holds the sear onto the weapon. So these two screws need to be removed. So that is the bridle. This is the sear. So this is what the trigger activates against in order to release the tumbler. And the tumbler is screwed into the cock so we unscrew this. And then the conch separates from, usually does. And if it's being stubborn, there we go. Doesn't usually require much more than a gentle tap to remove it. And then from here, the last bit of disassembly is to remove the top jaw here so that the weapon is fully disassembled. Looks like it's being a bit stubborn. 
And I'm not going to try to cut myself on that, so I'll work on that later. But uh, that's the flintlock, the British Land Service short, completely disassembled. I'm going to go ahead and put all these parts in an organized way so that I know where, all their go where they go. And now, oh, and now we go to the French Charleville. All right. So, whereas the Brit is held together with pins, the French musket is held together with bands. So, in order to take this weapon apart, I do also want to remove the rammer on this weapon as well. They're distinct enough I can keep them next to each other and I know exactly which one's which. The first thing I want to do is start depressing the spring here to release the various pieces of the bands. And the bottom one's just held in with friction, so it requires a little pulling, a little work. And there we go. Now with those removed, I can go ahead and same with the Brit, pull the screws off the back to remove the lock. I just want to try to get the lock plate off as well, or the back plate off as well. Not really damaging the threading on this. If I were applying enough force for that, that would be a problem. But we're not doing that. Alternatively, I can use a screwdriver and get that spring. Get that out. That allows me to remove the lock. Again, we'll set that apart. Get the barrel completely pulled off first. And same deal. It's held together with a tang screw. So we will go ahead and remove the tang screw. This one, we because the French have a lot easier time pulling the barrels off because the barrel bands are very simple, we usually take the barrels off of the fr French muskets much more often, and so the tank screws are a lot easier to remove. Set the lock apart. Same with the, uh, the British musket. The, lock, uh, the, uh, the stock itself has a trigger housing. It is easy to remove, but it usually requires a little bit more work than I'm willing to put into it since I can get to all of the parts and clean them and make sure they're all working without having to disassemble it. We really want to make sure that all of these parts are good. So, yep, we'll get to the bar barrel in a little while, get that cleaned, but it's looking all right. Uh, and now it's time to go ahead and disassemble the lock. So we're going to go ahead and take our French parts, move them to the other part of the table here. And the internals are pretty similar to what you see with the French musket or the British musket. Um, you know, the proportions are going to be a bit different, so they're not interchangeable parts by any measure. Uh, but it does allow, it does make a fairly simple firearm um, that both weapons essentially use all of the same functional components. All right, so same way, we're going to go ahead and take a spring depressor and go ahead and put tension on the spring. Well. I did start with the outside of the lock last time. That's a good idea. So we'll go ahead and bring the weapon under tension. And start with removing the feather spring. Then we will go ahead and remove the hammer. Uh, there is one additional part to the French muskets that is... Uh, able to be removed that you cannot remove with the British muskets, which we will show you in just a moment. So it is well worth watching this portion as well. But with the spring, again, put it under tension. You do not want to try to remove a spring that's not under tension. Again, mostly because you're having a good chance that's going to come apart and snap on you potentially injuring you, potentially flinging metal parts around the shop. Um, but in addition to that, um, it just makes it very hard to remove the spring, or remove the screw. So we're going to go ahead and 
work on that, get that screw out, and oh, still a little bit more. Right. There we go. Alright, and gently remove tension on the spring. There we go. And as I said before, feather spring, or the uh, sear spring, not under a lot of tension, and so not as big of a deal removing. I just keep my thumb there and make sure it doesn't snap out and spring at me if it does come under release, but like I said, not, not really a big issue. Now's the bridle. So as we had with the uh, British musket, the bridle covers the tumbler, holds it in place, as it also holds the sear in place. This one looks like it has gotten a little dirty over the use, so it's probably going to require quite a bit of cleaning. And I just like to keep the screws with whatever part I'm working on. And finally, the cock is held with a large screw that holds the cock to the tumbler, which we're going to go ahead and remove. I think it's a better, better screwdriver for this, so I don't strip the screw. There we go. And now finally, there's also, so again, tumbler and the cock. Now there, like I said, one part of this musket that is going to be substantially different from the British musket. These are the lock plates, the British ones here, the French ones here. On the back side, the French lock, or the French uh, pan can be removed. And that actually makes it immensely easier to clean in comparison to the British, although it does mean that there's another screw in another part that I have to keep track of. But when fully disassembled, there's a bit of a difference. So we've now disassembled two muskets, the British Land Service Short and the French Charleville. And uh, now it's about time I get into actually cleaning the thing. Uh, what we're going to have to do is first clean the locks, ensuring that they are, are fully cleaned, making sure that all the screw holes and everything like that are all properly cleaned out. There's no oil. There's no grime. There's no dirt. Uh, once all of that's been done, then I'm going to go ahead and ensure for the British muskets that all the brass portions have been polished. And uh, we're going to also make sure that the undersides of the British muskets are prepared so that when they go back into storage, they don't uh, end up with uh, additional rust building up over time. Because I'm not going to get to those in the undersides as often as I will with the French. The French muskets don't really need to be prepared on the underside of the barrel since we pull the muskets apart fairly often to clean them. So now everything's disassembled. It's time for me to just go ahead and get to work cleaning them. This could be a lot of work. <laughs>
right, so that's, uh, that's how we handle cleaning our muskets. Now, uh, we end up firing these muskets far more realistically than these weapons probably would have ever been fired by an actual soldier. And of course, uh, we don't just have one musket. Um, I've just finished these two. I already finished a few more earlier this week. So uh, out of our 35, I have completed 10 and we are now down to still 25 more to go. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys for, for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, if you guys have questions about how we handle cleaning the weapons or about our maintenance in general, about the weapons themselves, um, I mean, we're more than happy to answer those questions for you and uh, we hope you have a nice day.